but the gospel we preach never is. To come study the Bible with the Church of Christ, we're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. What power? What power? After losing a debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Real Local, WGSR 47.1 in high definition. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Ofer here with you, and we're glad that you are tuned in for uh, another study from God's Word. We had some interesting callers on that last program, and uh, uh, as, the, as this program goes on, we'll be glad to answer those questions if you want to call in, and uh, uh, we'll be glad to give you a Bible answer for those questions as well. But I know Kayla put this uh, content information up for us before, uh, uh, before they went off the air, but this is where the church meets in Eden, 250 the Boulevard. My phone number is 276-340-2653, word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can uh, reach us. Also there in, uh, uh, is our information for Bible studies. Have not, uh, Sundays at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Thursday night Bible study at 7 p.m. Of course, then we come down here and you can turn the TV on and watch a word from the Lord uh, Thursday nights at um, uh, 9 o'clock, right after what does the Bible say. And, of course, we want to remind you of what does the Bible say on WHIG-TV? Uh, Michael Robertson will be down in Rocky Mount, so you can uh, log on to WHIG-TV uh, in, uh, out of Rocky Mount, and you can watch that program uh, at 10 o'clock when we go off the air. I've got to get my phone situated because I know that it's probably going to ring. Someone's going to call me, and I'm going to turn it down to where I won't be disturbed. <clears throat> but anyway, we hope that you will visit with us and study God's Word with us, of course, 120 American Legion in Danville and 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville. It's where you can reach the brethren there, and there's content information where how you may get a hold of, of them. <clears throat> Tonight, I want us to talk about the first community church and the dangers of the community church. You know, the uh, uh, seems like one of the uh, very current trends is to be at the church that is not a church, you know, we're not really, we're not really the, uh, a denomination in the sense that we're not wearing a name that is traditionally put on 
a, a religious group. And so they're non-denominational in that, in that regard in the sense of they don't really identify with the Baptist or the Methodist or Lutheran or Presbyterians. And so you may hear terms like community church. You may hear terms like non-denominational. But friends, when you hear the term non-denominational from all the, the, in the religious community, what they really mean is they're interdenominational. In other words, you can come and you can be what you want to be, do what you want to do, say what you want to say, and they're really not going to pick and choose on doctrine. See, doctrine is bad to these folks. And so what, we, uh, what, what they really mean is it doesn't matter what your religious background is. If you just believe in God, believe Jesus, then, then we're probably going to be all right. So really they're interdenominational. You may go there and you may find people with a Baptist background, a Lutheran back, background, a Catholic background, or maybe uh, you know, a Pentecostal holiness background, and they're all together because... Uh, you know, we just don't want to be distinctive or we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Like the lady that called in the, the previous hour, you know, can't talk about anybody. But I, want to, I suggest to you that these are really the product of mixed up religions. And they're really the product of individuals who try to blend different religions together and then still say they're worshiping God. Now, you might say, well, that's a pretty modern trend, though. Uh, you know, most, most of the time, these denominations, they, they're pretty, in the past, they've been pretty distinctive, they're uh, separate from each other. Uh, maybe they might uh, have joint meetings from time to time, but they're pretty uh, different from everyone else, especially, you know, 100 years ago, it was the case that they were debating each other. They, the doctrinal differences were, were important, but now we're kind of all blending together and we just come, become one big melting pot, if you will, of, of religious uh, uh, porridge, if you will. And so th that's really the product of mixed up religion. And I'm going to show you, this is really not that common. This is really not common. You know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. So I submit to you folks that when you find a religious group that decides to do something new, uh, it's really not new. It's been tried before. It may have been tried and discarded and someone you know, brought it back to life, but really what you're finding is this is something that has been tried before and it will be tried again because individuals don't really want to get down to doing exactly what the Bible says. Now, I want to show you where the first community church originated. I call this the first community church because what happened was the same thing that you see in the community church movement. And just see if this doesn't look like or it doesn't sound like what you see in this so-called religious ecumenical movement where everybody comes together and we don't really want to make distinctions as long as we believe God. The first community church I, I want to tell you about is the Samaritans. The Samaritans. Now, I say the Samaritans were the first community church because they are the product, again, of this uh, uh, mixed-up religion. Now, we find the Samaritans have their beginning in, in 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 17. I'm going to pull this script up here. In 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse uh, uh, 23 or 24, this is what we're going to notice. Now, I'm going to give you a little background really before this. Uh, so let's actually start. Let's actually start in verse uh, 17. That is probably the best, best place to start. So 2 Kings chapter 17. And uh, we're going to come down and, and see what, uh, where the, uh, the start of the Samaritans were. 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 17. Uh, now, Israel was the product of false religion. I mean, they, they went off into uh, idolatry very, very quickly. Go all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 12, and you find, uh, you find Jeroboam set up the, the two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan. Uh, he was given ten tribes, the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and he gave them those tribes, or he was given those tribes, and uh, in order to keep them from going back and worshiping at Jerusalem, he set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan. And he changed the, the day of worship, he changed the priesthood, and he changed the, the object of worship. And, uh, 
And, and basically, the Bible says he caused Israel to sin. And Israel, the northern kingdom, never got away from following what Jeroboam started. And so they were always practicing idolatry. They had no good kings, no good leadership uh, as far as that goes. And so they went off into idolatry. And so because of this, when we get to 2 Kings chapter 17, you're going to find that Israel is going to be carried away. And this is what they did. The Bible says, And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the, in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So the northern kingdom, Judah, was carried away. They were carried away by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians came and they, and they conquered Samaria and they, and they carried them away. Uh, uh, let's look. Let's come on down to verse 22 now. Let's see something else. And so the Lord carried Israel away. And verse 22 says, And the children of Israel, this is the northern kingdom, walked in the, way, in the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all the, uh, by all the servants of the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to, the, to Assyria unto this day. So Israel was, was gone. Israel was gone. The, their, those ten tribes were, were carried off into captivity. Now, this is where the Samaritans uh, come, come to play. This is where the Samaritans come into existence. Now, if you'll notice, here's a map behind me, and I'll step out of the way you can see. You can see the Israel. Here's the northern kingdom, Israel. And then the southern kingdom down here is, is Judah. It's below the, the graphic here, but... Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. And Israel, the capital is Samaria. The southern kingdom's capital is Judah. Now, Israel is the one that's carried away. Now, here is where, here's, here's another map. Now, you can see, compared to, uh, compared to Israel, Assyria is huge. Assyria is a world empire. And so they carry, they carry uh, uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, away. They carried them off into captivity. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And uh, you may remember Nineveh. Somebody very uh, famous went to Nineveh to preach, and he took a little trip in the well, well's belly for a while and before he ever went to preach. But that's the capital of Nineveh. Well, here's Assyria. Assyria's come and carried away uh, Israel. And, uh, and so they're, they're gone. Well, the practice in that day was when you conquered a people, what you did is you relocate people. You take people out of a, out of a, of a region and you put your own people back in. So that's what you have. In 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 24, now notice, notice what we have. 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from uh, Cuthath and from Ava and from Hama and from Sepharavim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So here's what you have. You have these Assyrians or these uh, 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 Assyrian-influenced uh, uh, individuals that have been captured, and, and they're carried off down here to, uh, uh, to Israel, into the northern kingdom, into Samaria. And so what the king does, the king, he brings his people in. But notice what happens. Notice what happens there in verse uh, 25. And so it was in the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Where therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. Verse 26. Wherefore they spake unto the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed, that's Israel, the nations which thou hast removed, know not the manner of the, uh, and, uh, ha and placed in the cities of Samaria, know not the manner of the God of the land. So the people that have been uh, carried out of their place and put into Israel don't know about the God of Israel. And he says, so what happens is the God of Israel now has sent lions among them to slay them. And behold, they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the land. So we need to know some, figure out something to do. So what does he do? Verse 27. And the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, 
and let them go and dwell there and let him, watch it, teach them the manner of the God of the land. So what you need to do is you need to take a priest and you need to find out or let, let them teach these people that we have replaced and uh, uh, re, excuse me, relocated into Israel, let him teach them about this God of Israel. Now, keep in mind that the people that were carried away from Israel, the northern kingdom, they didn't really know how to serve God either. I mean, they'd been worshiping false gods all this time. So they really, if this was a priest that came from there, he really wasn't uh, uh, a, a good representative to teach the people to start with. But anyway, so they send him back. They send him back. Then one of the priests whom they carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But you know what? He didn't know how to do it either. He wasn't really, uh, he was better than what, than, than what they were doing, but he really wasn't much. He's kind of like today. You know, you might say, well, this guy's got a lot of Bible knowledge, but, well, he's out in the denominational world, so he's really not teaching the truth. All right? So he's teaching them what he knows about the God of the land. And uh, so then it says, How be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. Every nation of their cities wherein they were, uh, they dwelt. And the men of, no, no, it says the men of Babylon made uh, uh, Succoth Benoth, and the men of Cuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Ivites uh, made Nibshaz and Tartak, and the Seraphites burnt, uh, burnt their children in the fire uh, to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of the, of the Seraphim. Now you see what they did? So they feared the Lord and made themselves the lowest of the priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them, in the place in the houses of the high places. So what they did was they blended this already corrupted version of how to serve God from this priest that was brought back. And what they did, they just added more to it. And so they said, well, we'll just include him in our worship, and but we're still going to serve our own gods, and we'll make our own houses to our own gods. So they they blended, they just mixed all these religions together. Now, do you think that's really helping matters? No, it's not, friends. They, they took a watered-down, polluted version of the truth and mixed it with some more pollution. Now, listen. How many of you want to go down here to the Dan River and drink some of that water that has some coal ash spilled in it? Well, probably no one's, I don't want to drink that. Well, you know what you're doing in religion? What you're doing in religion, you're taking... You're taking that Dan River water that has the coal ash in it, and you're pouring some, you're pouring some some oil and some chemicals and some all you know all kinds of uh, filthy trash into it, and you're saying, oh, now it's better. That's what it's like. And so this is the, this is the product of this mixed religion. And look, look what the Bible says in verse 34: Unto this day they do after the former manners; they fear the fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after the ordinances, or after the law and commandment, uh, which the Lord uh, commanded the children of, of Jacob, whom he named Israel. So they're not really keeping it. They're not really keeping these law. Verse 35, With whom the Lord had made a covenant, and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear, ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. Well, apparently the priest didn't get around to that. The priest that was brought back to teach in Samaria didn't get around to all this. It didn't phase them one bit. But the Lord who brought you up out of, uh, I'm sorry about that, but the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and stretched out his arm, him shall ye fear and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye uh, do a sacrifice. So they uh, they basically just uh, have, have made a, a corrupt uh, religion, and corrupted even more. Now, this was the this was the beginning of the Samaritans. You got all these foreign pagan worship worship uh, practices, and you have a priest who was not uh, really astute and real thorough on teaching the, the the commands of God, 
and and they just all mixed it, mixed it all together. It's a community church. It's the interdenominational church. See what we're saying? Now notice what happens. So, so as the result is, the result is you have the, the Samaritans. They fear the Lord, but they worship their own God, and so they really didn't fear God. They really didn't fear God. Now, this is the beginning of the Samaritan religion. Now, let's fast forward about 180 years. Let's fast forward about 180 years. Israel has been carried off into captivity, the northern kingdom, and they're gone. But now Judah, Judah has been carried off into captivity by the Babylonians. And they are going to be in captivity for 70 years. Well, after that 70 years, all right, after that 70 years is up, Ezra is sent back to build the temple. Now, we, now let's pick up in Ezra chapter 1. All right, Ezra chapter 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the Persians came in and they, uh, uh, they took over from the Babylonians. All right, so the Persians came in. Now, Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, that, the Lord, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up he, the spirit of Cyrus, uh, king of Persia, that he made a decree, he made a proclamation throughout all this kingdom and put also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. All right, so Cyrus, this Persian king, is saying, God has charged me to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in, Ju in Judah. And so what does he do? He makes the proclamation that whoever wants to go back, uh, sorry, verse 3, Ezra 1, verse 3, who is there among all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God. All right, so if you want to go up, you go up. And he says, anybody who stays there, whosoever remaineth in his place, where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides the uh, free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus is going to send a group back to rebuild the temple. Well, he sends a man named Ezra. Or, excuse me, he sends a man named uh, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the one who goes back in the, in the first carrying away, our first return. The first return. So after 70 years of Judah being in captivity, they return under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was there, and he's going, to, he's going to rebuild the temple. He's going to rebuild the temple. And guess who shows up? Guess who shows up? The Samaritans show up, right? This community church, this community church from Samaria, the Samaritan community church is what you might say. Now, let's look at this. In Ezra chapter 4 and verse 1, here they are, they come, and they're going to talk to Zerubbabel. And they want to have this big unity movement, you know. Let's, let's have a big ecumenical unity movement. Let's all get along because, after all, we all serve the same God. Look what they say. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers, and said unto them, now I like this, listen carefully. Look what they said to Zerubbabel. They said, let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asarhaddon, king of Asher, that's the king of Assyria, which brought us up thither. You see that? He said, well, the king, the king of Assyria brought us into Samaria, and we've been worshiping your God ever since then. Because, after all, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Assyrian king sent a priest back and has taught us all about your worship, so we're, we're basically the same thing, see? We're worshiping the same God. We, we all believe in the same God, right? Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound just like the community church? Doesn't that sound like the... The, uh, the interdenominational, non-denominational, interdenominational, ecumenical community church? Number two? <laughs> See, doesn't that sound like that? Well, we, we all serve the same God. 
We all serve the same God. Now, friends, here's the problem. They don't serve the same God. Their, their religion, their worship, is corrupt from the beginning. It was taught them by a corrupt priest, really, when you get right down to it, and then they added, on top of that, they added all their other religions that they brought with them, and now they want to come along and say, well, hey, we're all together. We're all together. How, uh, friends, how many times have you heard people call in and say, well, we're all, we all believe Jesus. We're all the same. We're all in, in the Lord. We're all in the body of Christ together. We all believe different things. We all worship differently, but hey, we're all in it together. You know what Zerubbabel says? Look what Zerubbabel says to him. In verse, uh, in verse 3, Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel. You don't have anything to do with it. But we're going to do it just as Cyrus told us. You don't have any part in this. Now, friends, let me, let me remind you. There's a, a lot of criticism toward us when we say, well, y'all, y'all think y'all the only ones. I think uh, I was listening to a, a, a caller on, on video. I think I may play the, the call uh, later on. But he basically, well, y'all think y'all the only ones that got it right. Well, Zerubbabel thought the same thing. And he told all these other religious groups, you don't have any part with us. And God seemed to be pleased with Zerubbabel when he said, oh, no. We're not going to be a part of this big ecumenical unity, so-called unity uh, community church. No, y'all are in the community church. We are the true Israel of God. And you don't have any part with that. Now, you know what happened when he said that? You know what, he, what happened when he said that? When he told them, the Samaritans, this Samaritan community church, you are not part of us they, the Samaritans, started being mean. They started trying to undermine the work that Zerubbabel was doing. See, there wasn't any tolerance for, for Zerubbabel. There wasn't any tolerance for the children of Israel. Once you say, oh no, you don't have part with us, well, you better look out then because you, now nah, you're just a racist, bigot, hate monger. You think you've got the only truth? Oh no. So what did they do? They, they, made, they made problems. Look at this. Look what it says in verse 4. Verse 4. They said, uh, And the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they hired counselors. They wrote letters. They sent letters back to the king. They stirred up all the people, tried to undermine the work. That's exactly what the denominations do to the Lord's church today. All the so-called interdenominational, non-denominational community church types that want to say, well, we're all one big family, we're all getting along. When you say, mm, no, we're not the same. Oh, well, you just, you might as well have, Pulled a pin and a grenade and throw it at them. Boy, you talk about getting full of hate. I don't know who you think you are. Y'all y'all think y'all the only ones going to heaven? No, friends. Let me tell you. There's only one true religion, one way to worship God. And just like in the days of Zerubbabel, when he's trying to rebuild his temple, there was only one thing that God required. He required them to keep the commandments and to do as he said. And yet, all the people of the land did what they wanted to do, but yet they wanted to claim God as their God. And we are Zerubbabel saying, no, you aren't part of us. We want you to be part of us. If you would, re if you would repent and obey the gospel, then you could be part of us. You could be with us. But because we say no to you, all of a sudden now we're the bad guys. See that? And so all of this, my point is all of this is is the product of the so-called community church, the ecumenical interdenominational movement. 
mixed religion. And it got to the point, if you will, notice this in Ezra 4 and verse 23, it got to the point that uh, the work building the temple actually stopped because of all of the, the, the lies and the hatred and the uh, uh, undermining of the work that was done by the so-called Samaritan Community Church. The Samaritans. Now, were they really full of compassion? Were they really what they said they were? You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of all the folks uh, who, who profess to obey God and love God, and yet when we try to do a work, all kind of efforts come out to undermine us. Like in Danville a couple of years ago. You know? All the city bigwigs came out to try to stop the tent. Well, we got some complaints, so we need to inspect every little nook and cranny of this tent. And you can't have you can't start the tent meeting. See what that what's that all about? All of that because Westover Baptist Church, you know, got got a little upset because someone dared ask them a question. See how it works? Oh, well, I thought we was all in this together. I thought you worshiped the same God as we do. Apparently not. Apparently you were just lying about it. Now, that's what Zerubbabel was saying. Well, wait a minute. You know, if you if you if we all serve the same God, how come you're trying to undermine the work we're doing? How come you're trying to hinder us from building up a temple to him? You know why? Because they really are not truthful in their service to God. They're just liars. They're deceitful. And friends, anybody that's, that says they love God, but yet they doesn't keep his will, the Bible says they're a liar. See, that's not us. That's the Bible talking. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So, if, you really, if we're really on the same page, then why aren't we all teaching the same thing and working for the same goal? The, the, the Samaritan Community Church in Zerubbabel's day, they said, oh, we're, we're worshiping the same God. But when you correct them and say, oh, no, you're, you're not doing exactly the same thing we're doing, well, then we're going to undermine it. We're going to stop what you're doing. And so they did. So they did. So they stopped the building of the temple. Well, the temple was was rebuilt. The temple was rebuilt. Now, let's fast forward again. Let's fast forward a little bit more to Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah and, and Ezra are, are contemporaries. Ezra comes back. The temple's rebuilt. Now, Nehemiah comes back, and Nehemiah is going to build a wall around Jerusalem. He's going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The temple's built, but there's nothing protecting it. So, Nehemiah goes back and he's going to rebuild the walls. Well, guess what happens when Nehemiah gets back? When Nehemiah gets back, he starts rebuilding the walls and these same Samaritans come and they try to hinder the work. They ridicule them. They mock them. They threaten them to the point that Nehemiah had to put, somebody, had to put all of his men on the wall and they were work, had a trowel in one hand and a spear in the other. You know, they were working with one hand and a weapon in the other. And they rebuilt the wall in 52 days. And Nehemiah goes back to report to the king, just as he promised. But when he returns, he returns from the king, he comes back to Jerusalem, and guess what he finds? He finds that the people have married with the people of the land. Look at this. Now let's look at Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah 13 and verse 23. All right. Here we go. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab. They've married, they've married these, these people, these strange women, foreigners. And their children, notice, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language. But according to the language of each people. Now, let's think about that. You see, here's another product of mixed religion. A product of mixed religion is, is number one, is really the, the, the lack of unity, even though they profess it. 
And now you have the, uh, uh, the, the mixed language. The Jews couldn't even speak the Jews' language. They, they spoke this broken language, mixed language. But you know what? Religious, mixed religion means mixed speech. Friends, let me, let me just give you a case in point here. How many times do people talk and use religious terms and yet they're so foreign to the Scripture? They're nothing like what the Bible says. Oh, that may be a term that's in the Bible, but it's not in no way, shape, or form used in how the Bible uses it. See, that, that's, that's, that's mixed language. People call it, well, what about uh, the lady that called in and talked to Caleb and, uh, and Drew? What you say? If a person is, is, is a, is a born-again Christian who got saved and then was baptized, Well, you see what I'm saying? You're saying, that's like saying a person who was, who was washed and who bathed and who was cleansed. You see, all, those mean all the same thing. But, but see, the religious community, they use these terms and they, oh, well, it means different. I got saved. You don't find that in the Bible. You don't find got saved in the Bible. But here's one I have up here for us to consider. What about the term pastor? 99% of the people who call in and talk about a pastor, they think it means the preacher. And not really understanding that pastor is a specific <clears throat> office or a specific uh, uh, a job description. And they're probably not even aware that, uh, that it refers to a certain type of person that actually has qualifications. Now I'll play you a little bit of this of this video clip. This is a, a, a individual that I I believe they're over here at uh, Piedmont Baptist Church. Uh, he's defending uh, uh, Dwayne King, and we're talking about pastor. And just listen to what he says. It's kind of lengthy. We probably won't listen to all of it. You know what, sir? I, I have invited. I, Phil Kidd does not scare anybody in Rockingham County. Sir, I have gone up and invited Phil Kidd to come to our tent when he's in town. I've ha invited him to come on this set, and he won't do it. He has boxing gloves on his on his website, but he won't step foot in our tent. If you come on to revival, sir, I, touch, sir, you, you know what? Saved. I'm sorry. You, if you come to revival, if your Lord may touch, you might get saved. You know what? If I come to your tent, I'm, I'd be afraid for my life. You know why? Because because you Baptists, all you do is threaten. No, we don't threaten. We yes, just, we, we preach the word of you God. You don't threaten. threaten. You don't threaten. Are you sure you don't threaten? No, sir, I don't threaten. Well, let me let me just play this for you then. Uh, do you remember a guy named Paul Basden? Never heard of. Him. Well, he's a member. He was a member of Piedmont Baptist over there where you're defending, and I want you to listen to what what he says now. On occasion, Johnny was invited over to y'all's school. Right? Dwayne King teacher college or school? He got told. He got told every okay. Monday night. All right. He, was in, he and Jason Harrison went over. They were invited. And when they got over there, they were threatened. And this is what was stated after the fact. I just want you to listen to it. We got audio, Tyler. Uh, that's Paul Basden. He is in the, the Baptist College. Would you verify uh, that those individuals talked about threatening us the other night? Hey, you deserved it. Oh, did you hear that? I really appreciate that, folks. Uh, that's Paul Basden. He is in the, the Baptist College over there, Piedmont Baptist College, and he actually said we deserve to be threatened. Would you verify uh, that those individuals talked about threatening us the other night? And you deserved it. And you deserved it. And you deserved it. And he is in the, the Baptist College over there, Piedmont Baptist College, and he actually said, We deserve to be threatened. And you deserved it. And you deserved it. And he is in the, 
the Baptist College over there, Piedmont Baptist College, and he actually said, we deserve to be threatened. And you deserve it. And you deserve it. And he is in the, the Baptist College over there, Piedmont Baptist College, and he actually said, we deserve to be threatened. Now, now, do you think someone deserves to be threatened with bodily harm? Well, that's, uh, uh, that's hearsay. I that's not there. hearsay. You wouldn't know either. He was there. That's pa hearsay. Paul Basin was there. I go out tomorrow and say, you said something that don't mean you said it. Sir. The brother King of our they preach the straight. Sir, there was a 60, I believe, 64-year-old man who said he could whoop Jason and Johnny both. And here's a man who's verifying that it was said and that it was deserved. Now, that's the... Okay, that's not actually the clip I thought. I actually was going to play that with talking about the threatenings and the, um, the, the kind of language that the Samaritans were doing. Here they were threatening, and this is exactly what you have amongst the so-called, you know, our, our so-called brethren. They're our brethren. They're our brethren when they want to be agreeable. But when you say, no, you're wrong, then all of a sudden now you're the enemy and we threaten them. So got that out of place. I don't have the, the, the caller on the, on the pastor, but you can, uh, you might recall when individuals talk about pastor, they think, well, that's the preacher. But friend, that is not what the Bible says about a pastor. The pastor is not just a preacher. Now, he may preach, but the Bible never talks about one pastor being in charge of, of the church, but yet the denominational world, they think that. Now, where did they get that? Where did they get this idea that one man is the pastor, or one man is the leader. Let's think about that. Hmm. You think they mixed their religion from somewhere? What religion can you think of that has one man as the papa, I mean, uh, pa uh, pastor? Oh, yeah, the Catholics, the Pope. Now, you see what happened? Well, we're going to mix it. We're going to get a little bit of our religion from the Pope, and we're going to have one man rule. Friends, in the New Testament church, you never had one man who was in charge of all the church. As a matter of fact, you actually have condemned that very thing. Look at this. In, uh, <clears throat> in the book of 3 John, 3 John, uh, John is writing to a man named Gaius, and notice what he says in his letter. He says in verse... Uh, uh, Verse 9, he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I'll remember his deeds, which he do, doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive us, receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now, there's, there is the one-man rule right there. He's the dictator. He's the diatrophies. And yet everybody in the so-called religious world thinks, well, well, the pastor, the pastor is the one we need to listen to. We have to obey the pastor. We have to do what the pastor says. Well, see what mixed religion has done for you? You've actually set yourself up in a system where one man dictates everything that goes on. That's, that's a mixed religion. And it's no different, it's no different than what you had in the in the community church of the Samaritans. The Samaritans community church, they wanted to be interdenominational, interreligious, and let's all be together, we all serve God the same. Oh no. You can't be you can't be the same if you're all worshiping in a different way. And that's what we've always said, friends. That's why this idea about the community church and, and the interdenom interdenominational churches, they're not true. They can't be true. Jesus said that they would be one, that we would all be one if we believed on the word. John 17, verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Friends, if the word, if the word is the same, then we'll all be the same. If we're all speaking the same things, then we can all be the same. But when you start mixing all these different religions, all it does is create problems. Now, look. Let's look. Let's look at this. 
Now let's fast forward from Nehemiah. Let's fast forward. Uh, let's fast forward about. Uh, let's see. Let's fast forward about 500 years or so. All right. Let's fast forward and. Sorry about that. Get the Bible off the screen here. Now let's fast forward about 560 years or so. And we meet Jesus in John 4. And guess who Jesus is talking to? He's talking to a Samaritan. Now, you see, this religion has been passed down. Generation to generation. Oh, mama did it, daddy did it, grandma did it, granddad did it. So, you're a Samaritan. I'm a Samaritan. I was born a Samaritan, bred a Samaritan. And when I die, I'll be, a, you know, be Samaritan dead. That's what she'd be saying, I guess. Oh, yeah, she's proud to be a Samaritan. Well, let's just look at this. In John, John chapter 4, notice what, what we have here. John chapter 4, and we're going to start about in verse 4. John 4. He must needs go through Samaria. This is Jesus. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. All right. Now Jacob's well was was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, "Give me drink." For her disciples were going to the city to buy meat. Now, here's a Samaritan woman, and the Samaritan woman is really mixed up in her religion. Because she's been the product of mixed up religion all this time. Now friends, I want you to stop and see if maybe you might be the Samaritan woman. Because the Samaritan woman was the product of a religion that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Everybody's kind of bringing in their own little thing. and You know, I don't really know any different. But look what she says. Let's skip down to verse uh, about verse 19. Verse 19, and here's what the Samaritan woman says. She says, uh, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship, where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. Now friends, is it really wrong to tell someone that they're worshiping incorrectly? Is it really wrong to tell someone that what they're doing is unscriptural? We hear people all the time say, oh no, you shouldn't tell people that. Well, Jesus did. Jesus didn't have a problem telling people. He told this woman, you don't know what you're worshiping. Because she was the product of mixed up religion. All right, I'm going to take this phone call. You're on the word from the Lord. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I want to ask you one question. Where, where, where in the world is, is this world going to ever get anywhere when it ain't nobody doing nothing of reality? Ain't nobody doing nothing okay. of maturity. Yeah, and, and I it's know. And there's a way that this world can win if everybody... Okay, all right, there's, there's the salad guy. All right, <clears throat> uh, we'll go on and on with this guy. Sir... I can't take your call. You you get us way off track, and you and you never get to a point. All right, so so here, here's what we're talking about. So here's a woman who's mixed up. Jesus says, "You ye worship, ye know not what." Now look at the product. Look what happens when you have mixed up religion. The 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 Samaritans were mixed up on marriage. They're mixed up on weddings. You might say, let's just say weddings. They're mixed up on what marriage really was. Look, in John 4, verse 16, John 4, verse 16, uh, listen to what Jesus says. John 4 and verse 16. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Well hast thou said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he with whom 
thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou sayest truth. Now how do you think about that? What were the Samaritans, what had they must have been teaching about marriage and divorce? For her to have had five husbands and then she's living with somebody that's not her husband. Now either she was just living with him and they weren't married or she was actually shacking up with someone who was married. But in either case, Jesus said, the one that you now have is not your husband. That's, now that's the product of mixed up religions. You know why? Friends, you stop and think about this. When people stop getting away from what the Bible teaches about marriage and divorce and what God's law on marriage is, they will get all mixed up. Look at our country today. Our nation today has an extremely high divorce rate, over 50%, and people are, are, are clamoring and they're all upset about, well, one man, one woman, that's the way God designed it. But what they mean is one man and one woman at a time. Because they don't care how many times you get married and divorced as long as it's one man and one woman at a time. That's not what God said. And we have, we have uh, are, are experiencing or we're seeing the product of mixed up religion when people are starting to look around and say, well, you know what, we need to change what we said, you know, uh, uh, what, what we, we teach on, on marriage. Jerry Falwell actually said, he said, because of the high rate of divorce, we need to look again at what we're teaching on marriage and divorce. Well, you know what, folks? God's law hasn't changed on it. The only difference is man's trying to appeal or appease to individuals. But God's law hasn't changed. Matthew 19 and verse 3, God intended for it to be one man and one woman. One man and one woman. All right? Let's look at this. Matthew 19 and verse 3. The Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Uh, and he answered and said, uh, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? That was God's law of marriage, one man and one woman for life. God intended it that way because he only made one man and one woman. And he said in verse 9, For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That was God's plan. And the only exception, the only exception is in verse 9, except it be for fornication. Other than that, God intended for one man and one woman to be married for life. There was, that's God's, marriage on, on, uh, God's law on marriage. But mixed religion comes along and says, well, marry as many times as you want to. I'm not going to talk about it. Because if I talk about it, if I talk about how many times you've been married, or if I start questioning how many times you've been married, or I start looking at your marriage, you know what? I, I, may, I may find out some truth, and you know, you may leave. Well, friends, are you really doing them a favor if you don't talk about it? Are you really doing them a favor? Are you helping them out if you don't discuss it? But see, in our mixed up religion, we think that marriage is okay. We actually think that fornicating is okay. We actually have the preachers that are all fornicating. And then the, 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 uh, 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 the abused wife, you might say, or the, the, uh, uh, the wife that has been sinned against, Comes on defensive. Well, yeah, yeah, he had the Holy Spirit when he was uh, when he was in there fornicating. He was fornicating, but at the same time, he was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we defend it. We justify it. You know why? Mixed up religion. It's no different than what the Samaritans had. The Samaritan woman was a product of mixed up religion. And here she's all mixed up on marriage and divorce. And we have people today that nobody's going to talk about it. And so you have people who have been married three, four, five, six times for whatever reason, so confused, so mixed up. Little Billy, he don't have, he don't have uh, two daddies. He's got seven daddies, you know. Little Sally, she don't have two mamas. She's got 12 mamas, stepmamas, 20 stepchildren, sisters. Why? Because mixed up religion. Mixed up. Because no one is doing what God said do. All right? I'm going to take this call. 
All right. Guess, guess they hung up. All right. So the Samaritans mixed up. Mixed up on mar- weddings. They mixed up on worship. We just saw that. Jesus said, you don't know what you're worshiping. Friends, you, I've, been, I've been to some of these worship assemblies. And you look around at what's going on riding motorcycles up and down the aisle, jumping pews, hooping and hollering, running on the floor. You don't know what you're doing. Talk about doing things decently in order, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. It's not there. It's not there. And it's all because of mixed up religion. Well, you know what? I think what we need to add to our religion is a little bit of hooping and hollering and shouting. What we need to add to our religion, we need to add a, a band. See, it all starts with that piano. It all started with the piano. We're going we're to add the piano. Then we're going to add the guitar. Then we're going to add the praise team. Then we're going to add the, the concert. Then we're going to add the, the smoke and the mirrors. And we're just going to have us a real religious concert. You know, rock and roll for the Redeemer, I guess. Yeah. You know, good head banging music on Saturday night, and we'll just carry it over into Sunday morning. Mixed up religion. All mixed up. You don't know what you're worshiping. Friend, what are you mixed up on? The Samaritans mixed up on worship. They mixed up on weddings, mixed up on worship, and certainly mixed up on the way of salvation. Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. Because God used the Jews to bring Christ into the world. And he said, if you'd known who you're talking to, you'd have asked him for living water that you would never thirst again. And she says, well, give me some drink. Give me something to drink. She still messed up on it. She didn't understand. He's talking about spiritual water. But she went back and told the people, and they came and listened to Jesus. You know what? If you'll go back and listen to Jesus, you'll be unconfused. All this mixed up religion, you can have to get straightened out. But the question is, what are you mixed up on? You mixed up on the way of salvation? If you've been told the sinner's prayer, I know you mixed up. You're a product of this mixed up religion where people have just blended a little bit of everything. Well, we're going to add the sinner's prayer in here. We're going to add born in sin. Friends, when you start adding things to the Bible, you have to start adding things to correct the things you've added. I mean, think about that. You're born in sin. Well, now we have to add a, we have to add what we totally, totally to pray. Well, now we have to add unconditional election so that individuals who are born in sin can be saved. And now we have to add, well, once saved, always saved. And then we add, well, saved by faith only. And so you have to add all these false doctrines to cover up what you messed up when you added this mixed up religion. Friends, there's one way that you can be uh, clear. And that's just getting back to the Bible. And that's what we're trying to do. Friends, so don't be upset when we say, no, you don't have part, you're not a part of us. What you ought to be is upset about the fact that you're mixed up already. But you can get un- unmixed up. You can get untangled if you just obey the truth. Find the Church of Christ, Danville, Martinsville, Eden. Come visit us. We'll, we'll be glad to study with you and help you out in any way we can. Till next time, friends, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Want you to want to hope to see you. And if we can help you in any way, we'll do that very thing. Just always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. On AT&T UVerse Channel 47, and that includes Rockingham, Alamance, Guilford, Forsyth, and Randolph counties. We appreciate you as well. Well, we have 70 degrees. It's been cooler today compared to where it's been for the last few days, and we think that the rain probably played a big factor in that. Matt Smith is not with us today. We hope to have him back here tomorrow. But right now, I've got uh, some weather news for you anyway, and that includes that we're under a flash flood watch, and that's in effect for our North Carolina viewing counties of Rockingham, Caswell, and Stokes counties, and then Pennsylvania County and Henry County, Virginia, including the independent cities of Danville, Virginia, and Martinsville, Virginia. Now, this flash flood watch is in effect through late tonight. According to the National Weather Service in Blacksburg, Virginia, one and a half to three inches of rain expected. There could be even heavier amounts as these uh, rain showers uh, move across the 